You're listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum focused and dedicated 100% to sales development. If you care about growing your skills and getting more new sales appointments, pipeline, and closed one deals, you came to the right place. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, or Spreaker, and be sure to go back and listen to all the episodes for the best strategies, tips, and tactics out there on running a high-performance sales development program. And now, your host, founder, and CEO of TenBound at TenBound.com, David Delaney. Imagine cold calling a C-level executive at a Target account where he or she personally picks up the phone and agrees to a meeting because they just happen to be seeking a solution like yours. Stop imagining and start dialing with DiscoverOr, the world's leading prospect intelligence platform. Visit discoverorg.com forward slash SDR to learn more. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am really excited to get a who someone I consider a good friend of mine and someone who I've gone to over the years as a mentor that's helped me tremendously. And I'm so happy to bring him on the show and hope that he can help you as well. Mr. Brian Remington with AppsFlyer. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing very, very well. Uh, hi, David, and thanks for having me. <laughs> Dude, Long time listener, coming. first time caller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, by the time your episode goes live, it will be about 50 shows, which is wow, crazy when you think about it. Yeah. It's been awesome, man. And, and like I said, I've tapped you on the shoulder over the years, you know, when I was um, struggling or going through some issues with regards to sales development and other parts. And your mentorship has just meant a lot to me. So really appreciate you being on the show. Brian, if folks out there in the sales development world have not uh, run into you, tell us a bit about your background and how you got into sales development. Yeah, great. Again, I really appreciate you having me on. So about me, my background. So I won't go too far back because I'm definitely one of the one of the dinosaurs in in the SDR space, you would say. I've been very, very lucky in my career. I've always told myself and I still say this in interviews or when I talk to people that, you know, if if it wasn't for technology and the timing in terms of when I came out of college, I'd probably be a football coach and a history teacher somewhere because I really, really love competition. But I also really, really get a lot out of coaching, inspiring people. Um, cause that's really the shoulders I'm standing on where I am in my career is based on a lot of other people that got me to where I wanted to be, helped me through obstacles, were really there for me to lean on during uh, some of the tough times just growing up and evolving. So mm. The ability to give back has been absolutely fantastic. And again, in my career, I've been very, very lucky in that, you know, I spent time uh, early days of Salesforce, then early days of uh, LinkedIn, specifically around the Sales Navigator product and social selling, had the ability to uh, join New Relic and help build out really some global infrastructures when it came to the SDR function, the live chat function, the enterprise corporate sales function. So getting my fingers in a lot of different things. And I like to tell people too is, I've been lucky, but I think I've chosen companies in the right way in that I have something I call the corporate trinity. And it's basically, I look for leadership, I look for the product, and I look for culture. And I want leaders that are in it for the right reason. I haven't sold nine companies. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want someone who's in it for the long term and really wants to help companies. I want a product that without salespeople has sold itself and that customers truly, truly love using. And lastly, I want a culture of people who are there to learn and there to push each other. I like to call it coopetition in that, you know, we're going to do everything we can to help each other to the person to the left and the person to the right be successful. But at the end of the day, I kind of want to be first because that's how I'm driven. So, you know, spent time at all of those companies, been very, very lucky and had the opportunity to come to AppsFlyer and really help build out the North American entity, global company, uh, global leader in our space. The term is MAMA. So, mobile advertising and marketing analytics. So we help massive brands that you all probably use on a daily basis measure everything when it comes to their mobile applications from uh, user acquisition to retargeting to revenue driven for the corporations. Excellent. And I mean, God, what a track record. Salesforce, LinkedIn, New Relic. I'm sure AppsFlyer, you know, if it made it into your corporate trinity, which I really, I really like that you know, way that you structure how you get into companies. I'm sure that AppsFlyer's got uh, a ton of legs. Tell me about the 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 coaching. Like you, you kind of saw yourself as potentially a coach, maybe even a history teacher. You know, so I think some people are shy about asking for help and and going to someone to to get that coaching. 
what is it about coaching that you enjoy and, you know, you've brought to your career? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, thanks for the question. It's definitely something I'm, I'm very passionate about. And anyone who's knows me or has worked with me knows that, you know, I can, uh, I, I definitely wear it on my sleeve, but it, it really goes back to if I think of the times that I struggled the most, it usually was because I thought I could get to the answer myself. And it wasn't until either I raised my hand or lucky for me, someone noticed the struggle and came over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, stop, what can I do to help? And I've run across too many people in my career where you can just see them sort of bobbing in place and not having anybody around them. And a lot of us, especially SDR managers and leaders, have interviewed people that are coming from jobs where the company's doing well, it sounds like everything's going fine, but they're getting no mentorship and they're not getting taught and they're, they want to learn and they want to be challenged, but they're really, you know, there's no infrastructure that is helping them learn things that they don't have access to. Uh, and it's not the, you know, it's not 100% the company's responsibility to teach you everything you want to know, of course, because most companies don't have the time to do that. But it's creating a culture and more importantly, a climate that allows you the ability to go in, do your job really well, but then have another bucket of things that you can just fail at, right? Because without failure, gro- there is no growth. And too many places, when you fail, you brush it under the rug and you hope that no one sees it because you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're doing. I, on the other hand, you know, I kind of am pushing people to say, hey, if you're not failing a little bit, you're not trying new things. You're not experimenting. And I'm trying to tell you it's okay. And when you fall down, someone next to you will help up. They may giggle a little bit, but it's not at you. It's because they did exactly the same thing six months ago or a year ago or five years ago when they were an SDR. But some of it is really just your the process of you failing and realizing not just what good looks like, but knowing what bad looks like is even more important sometimes. So that learning culture, and that's one of the things that you look for in a company, that learning culture, and then bring you bring that in as a leader. Now, I, one thing you said, I try to do everything yourself. And I think that I, I fall into that, that category, you know, cause, yeah. and, and you, you, you said bobbing up and down. I, I, sometimes I feel like that. So if, if someone's out there, they're trying to do everything themselves and they're really, you know, bearing down on something and getting more and more frustrated, what should they do to reach out and, you know, try to find some support? The simple answer is never stop asking until you find someone who's willing to help, right? Don't, don't think that, you know, it's you go to your manager, you didn't get anything, you're done, right? You don't have a mentor program. There's no one around you. There are so many people, even even in life, and as you get, you know, to, to our ages, David, who won't, won't out us right now, but, you know, you realize that no matter what's going on in your life, you're not the first person to go through it, right? You really aren't. And while it's, you know, good to struggle a little bit and because it makes you tougher and, you know, gives you the, the, the scars you need, it's never not okay. I think that's the right words I was using there, but never not okay to reach out and keep reaching. And whether it's social media, whether it's groups, whether it's friends, whether it's other mentors outside of your business, always ask because it's going to take you less time to ask and find someone that can help you than it is for you to struggle and struggle and maybe never come out of that one thing. And that could be that one thing that either propels you to the next level or keeps you back. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's easy to get frustrated with sales yes. development, right? Because you're, you're trying to reach out to folks and especially on outbound, like you're, you're yeah. trying to get your message out there and people have millions of, of, of messages that they're dealing with. So, you know, if, if someone's frustrated and they, they need to try something new, you mentioned something, failure is okay. Uh, you know, yeah. to some extent on your team, you want to see some failure. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I'll take a little step back there as well is in order to build a culture and a climate. And again, to differentiate those two, like the culture is the words on the wall, right? The culture is what your company says it is to be an employee at that company. The climate is the environment that each leader in their pod with their team in their office creates to allow their the people on their team to live the culture of your company. Because we've all seen companies or heard of companies that have great words on the wall, and then each leader micromanages the hell out of all their people and never lets them actually live and behaviorize those things. 
So mm -hmm. what I really want to do is I want to get to a place where people not only know that failure is okay, but first things first, they have to be able to fall back on a predictable and productive foundation. So what I usually ask from people is, hey, when you come in, you know, I want to, my first goal is I want to give you a bunch of autonomy to be creative and go crazy and try a bunch of things. But I can't have you falling off a cliff and eternally just continually falling and have nothing to fall back on. So what I'm going to ask you to do first is just buy in for the next 90 days on a simple process that I like to say it's common practice, not commonly practiced <laughs> in our world, right? Okay. So that when you do fail, you're going to fall on something that allows you to keep moving forward instead of you know, just sitting there for the two weeks until someone realizes you're gone. Once you get to that point, it's really, really cool because it, it kind of, if you, if you know, like the situational leadership, like D1s through D4s, like you can literally see people moving from one section to the next where they're a cautious contributor. And then suddenly they get this confidence because confident people that fail learn, right? Cautious people that fail get scared and usually either stand still or take a step backwards. So it's our job as a leader to build that confidence first with a solid foundation to then give them the autonomy and the space to go and go crazy. Okay. So is that uh, part, like an onboarding program, for example, uh, your 90-day onboarding program? Or exactly. It, okay. Very clear. And whether it's you know onboarding program, made a lot of people at small, small companies may say, wow, that's great. We, don't, we haven't even formalized that word yet. Okay. It may just be the, you know, the clarity of expectations. That, you know, it's taking away the, when I come in today, what does Brian want me to do? And I feel like I worked hard, but is that what I was supposed to do? Get that out of the way quickly. Now, of course, you do as you evolve. You absolutely want to make sure that in those first 60 to 90 days, you're building competency. In that coming out of those 90 days or 60 days or whatever it is in your business, if it's 30, tell me your tricks, please. But you really want people to come out directionally confident in the things they were are supposed to do every single day. Now they may not be extremely good at them yet, but they don't suck and they're good enough, right? <laughs> and that's when you start building that confidence. You start seeing the successes, you start seeing the less misses and more hits. This definitely isn't baseball, but you can apply the numbers, right? If you're successful, you know, three out of 10 times, you're, you're pretty damn good. You're in the Hall of Fame, right? <laughs> in SD, it needs to be more than that. It really does, right? You really need to, because success isn't always a meeting. It isn't always an op. An answer is, is success. A yes and a no are fantastic successes. Maybe suck, and I think that's, you know, to pull Sandler into this. <laughs> but, you know, you really have to define what that job is. And sometimes it's brand awareness. Sometimes it's, you know, SLAs. Sometimes it's all these things. At the end of the day, all of those will lead to, to good, good outcomes because if the outcome is just learning and learning what bad looks like, again, major success in our book. You're setting the foundation. You're building that confidence. And yeah. this is really interesting because I was talking to someone who he started the sales development program at his company as the only sales development rep. And he was, he was oh. doing well and things were going well. And they tried to scale it. And they brought in a new person. And unfortunately, the, it didn't work out. Uh, the person couldn't produce the same results that the original person could do. Yep. And I'm thinking as, I, as I'm listening to you, it's that that solid you know uh, foundation had not been set and it was just kind of like hey how come you're not as successful as as i am you know right and it's interesting too and another another thing that i'm still going back and forth with you know in my 7th 8th year of building str organizations from the ground up it's the fact that until you get to a point where you have mass scale and mass success across scale, across different types of people in your business. And you can just bring an SDR in and replace one of 100 people, and they do similar things. You're always going to have autonomy and different approaches to success. And when you have one or two people, the biggest thing to be careful of is when you bring someone new into a team, especially doesn't have sort of a a manager or a team lead, and you really just have like two SDRs and they're all figuring it out, well, those two SDRs are successful because they figured out how their skill set would make them successful. And if this new person comes in and tries to mimic what the other person's skill set made successful and they don't have those same skills, they will not be successful. 
So you have to actually be able to take those little core little competencies and say, okay, this guy is successful for these 10 things. Here are the four I want you to mimic. And then we have to figure out the other six that fit your thing. Right. Right. Because some people are amazing email writers. Other people are kick ass on the phone. Other people suck at both, but they're just incredibly smart and driven and intrinsically ready to go and need some guidance. Right. You know, the, the sports analogy I use is, you know, I had a lot of buddies that, you know, going into the NFL and joined the Niners like in in the, you know, in the 90s. And they all went in and wanted to be Jerry Rice. And then they tried to do his workout and halfway through threw up and walked out <laughs> and went, oh, OK, I get it. Jerry's Jerry because he's Jerry. I can't be him. So I have to go figure out a workout that's going to make me the best me, not immediately follow him and assume I'm going to turn into him like that will never happen. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think especially because we're in the tech industry that, that mm -hmm. everything is ones and zeros and it's all about standardization and scalability. And, you know, how do I, how do I make everything, you know, a cadence or a sequence, you know, yeah. and, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Unfortunately, we do have to plug in these icky, squishy, you know, humans who have all these <laughs> different emotions and backgrounds and things like that. And, yes. and sometimes people are, kind of blind to that it seems yeah uh, and again the the, <laughs> the best teams are the ones that recognize that recognize right. the diversity on their team and that their team is all going to have different approaches and again if you're hiring if you get to that point and you're a massive multi-billion dollar company right that hires a similar you can get to a point where you hire a similar background and yeah. you're you can tell them in a year you're going to learn these 50 things you start with one, work your way through 50, and then you move on to something else. Most of us don't have that luxury. And a lot of us too, me personally, I don't, I don't ever want to be to that point. I want other people to surprise me every day and force me to change my process and go, holy crap, right? You know what? Video is not part of what we're doing right now, but it probably should be. So I want to start hiring people that love to put their face on their, you know, in their, in their prospecting messages. Not my face, I know they're talking, but their face. I, I'm, I'm looking for that and bringing different people in and, you know, letting them again, you know, fly their flag a little bit, which um, it comes down to goal setting as well. You know, it's one thing I, I am always a hundred percent behind is I try not to put goals in front of people. I try to explain to them where I want them to be and then have them tell me the goals that they want to reach in order to get there. Because if they create the goal, there's a lot more intrinsic passion in hitting it than if it's a goal that on paper I just handed them and told them they had to do. Wow. Okay. That's that's really interesting. One, I, I want to dig into that. But one thing I want to ask you, though, is, you know, you, you we were talking about this a little bit before. There's the startup mentality yeah. where you come in and you really have to, you're that first person who's setting up the sales development team. And you got to be creative. You got to figure everything out versus the big company where they've already figured out like all the processes, you know, 10 years ago, and all they need to do is have you click in. And I think we've both talked to people who they go into the startup and they're, they don't, they don't like it because there's just not enough process involved and they're looking for some process. And then right. you also talk to refugees from the big companies <laughs> who are like, dude, everything there's was laid out for me and I didn't have any creativity. Right. So, so, I, I guess, you know, in your point of view, you usually have gravitated toward trying to figure it out, right? And, and looking yeah. at your career, you've entered these companies at early stage and had to figure it out. Yeah. You know, the, you know, earlier in my career, there was a little bit more formulation, right? Like Aaron Ross had just left Salesforce. So mm -hmm. obviously there was some process already there, <laughs> but it, it's, it's really interesting to be a part of that, right? And it's, this is going to sound corny, but, you know, there's this old adage that, you know, if you build a cathedral, they will come, right? But then one day someone told me like, hey, let's change that. Let's hand everybody a brick and have them build the cathedral with us. Then we'll never have an empty seat, mm -hmm. right? So it's what, what is really cool is, you know, to be able to come into an organization and know you're going to bust your ass, but be able to look back and see the artifacts that you leave behind and know you had a hand in building them. And that's the early, like, you know, Simon Sinek, like why, like, you know why, cause you were there when it was built versus having to come into something to say, I'm doing these things. But if you ask me why I'm doing them, I, I don't, I don't a hundred percent know that I could give you the same answer as the person next to me. It's just yeah. what we do. It's just what we do. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why I love to know why we're doing things. 
a lot of that's just me, but it's also a lot of the people that I'm, that I'm hiring as well. Secondly, too, is, you know, I, I like to say, like, I, I have an entrepreneurial or even millennial mindset where, yeah, I want to come in and do my job really, really well, but I also want my ability to do my job well to open up 15 other doors because I want to know how everything works. Mm-hmm. I was that kid that when I got a you know remote control car for Christmas, I just wanted to take it all apart and figure out how it worked. <laughs> right. I didn't want to go build jumps and those kind of things. And it's hard to do that when you come into an organization that already has things built because now you're calling someone's baby ugly. Right. And they're like, well, why are you questioning the process? It works. Uh, yeah. Right. Yep. And it's funny because I have to now deal with that where I bring in amazing people and they go, this doesn't this seems wrong. Yeah. And I have to go, well, explain to me why, because if you can change it and don't find me a better way, I'm in. Like, let's do this versus like that. Well, that's bullshit. It's, it's always worked. But you also have people who come into, you know, small organizations like ours, like I have four SDRs across North America right now. And one of them brought in, you know, the, you know, predictive revenue book and said, you know, we should be doing this. And I was like, not with four people at a, at a startup. Like that's, I get it. And it's a great model, but that's a model when you have a mass of people and scalability and you can specialize across the board. We need the Swiss army knife approach to say, what do you need now? Right. Do you need the knife? Do you need the scissors? Do you need the toothpick? Like I got it all and just point me in the direction and focus me on what the output for today we're all gunning toward. How many more meetings could you set if your team made three times more calls per day and connected directly to decision makers? How much bigger would your pipeline be if you booked 20% more meetings this month? Don't wonder. Check out Discover Org at discoverorg.com forward slash SDR for personalized demo. That's, you know, that's really interesting because I remember as a... SDR manager, you know, I would get the process all set up and all the systems, everything's all, you know, dialed in and, and, and I was like, okay, I I need like at least a quarter to see if this even works, you know? And, and so I, I need people to just work the system. And then the next day somebody would come in and go, you know, we should really do this, you know? <laughs> and, and I remember just being really irritated <laughs> by that. But mm-hmm. I think what you're saying is be the bigger person and look at those ideas and, and, and kind of evaluate them, ask questions and potentially bring them into your process. Absolutely. If you say no to everybody, (laughs) right, then, then to be honest, six months from now, when that amazing idea should have been brought to you, it isn't anymore because you don't listen anyway. Right. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the cocky side of it would be like, Hey, if you built a flawless system, and everybody brings you ideas and you can prove to them that your idea is better, like good for you. Right. But the reality is different eyes, different backgrounds, different skill sets. There are different ways to do it, not better ways. There are different ways to do it as you bring different people in. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this one guy who was just irritated the hell out of me and he <laughs> kept bringing in all these different ideas, different ways to do it. He was challenging me constantly. And, and sure enough, he, he went on to become this, this very successful leader. Mm-hmm. Guy, he's like 25 years old, you know, at this big company. And I go, God, you know, maybe I should have listened to him more. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, okay, let me give you a scenario. Okay. So, cause you're, Thanks. you're a, someone who likes to come in and take, take apart the remote control car. So yeah. say you, you found your corporate Trinity. And you, you felt really great about the, the leadership team, the product, and the culture that you were coming into, but there was no sales development department in place. So they hired you to come in and make a sales development department. What mm-hmm. are, like, what are the, your first you know, two or three things that you would want to do to start out on the right foot? Uh, yeah, it's a really fantastic question. Gosh, we could talk for another hour on this, probably <laughs> on this topic, but I would say first and foremost, I want to understand what are we trying to solve by bringing in uh, a demand gen, sales development, business development, whatever you want to call it, function. Some people would say, you know, the specialization piece is my AEs now have so many deals they're working on and our deals are becoming more complex and they're becoming longer and they're becoming the ASP is a lot higher that they no longer have time to prospect. They no longer have time to follow up on leads because we now need to start measuring for marketing and creating SLAs and, you know, making sure that the money that's going out the door is actually someone's doing something with it. 
Or is it, you know, hey, we need to quadruple our sales team in 12 months and we don't want to hire externally. So we want to hire our bench. So we want our bench to start start learning now because our, our ramp time is six months in, in SMB and we can't have that. Or is it because we read a book and it said that if we don't have SD, we're stupid, right? <laughs> those, are, those are three completely different approaches, but unfortunately, they're three very real approaches. Yeah. But I would say first and foremost, I would look at the sales organization and say, if you had two extra hours a day, what would you use them for? And we would all sit down and understand and direct to see if we can get two more hours in the AE's hands or manager's hands or whoever was managing a lead volume, if there is any, or that outbound marketing to say, how can we drive revenue that way? And if we can, that's an easy sell because the ROI for an SDR, you know, when there's leads coming in or when there's prospect that needs to be done is, uh, is super easy, as you know, right? And you quickly hit ROI with that. But that would be the first thing. Why are we doing this? Because the last thing we want to do is do it because everyone else is doing it. And it seems like the right thing to do. There has to be, there has to be a, you know, what are we, what are we truly trying to solve for? And 90% of the time there is. But then you go down and you have to look at, okay, cool. Well, what type of person do we, do we want to bring in? You know, is it outbound? Is it leads? Is this someone that should report to marketing? Is it an MDR? Is this someone that should report to sales? You know, where should this person live? Because where, where is the value and the output driving toward? Excellent. So what type of person or, or sort of what's the, the job role? that we yeah, really skill need set. right now. What is the actual state, you know, system of work that we want this person doing? Because mm. it may not be someone who wants a long time, long term sales career all through enterprise. Mm. It may be a product marketer, right? It may be a creative writer, it may be a demand gen person, like who, who knows what it is, but you have to align. The big thing too there is if you truly get buy-in, you have to get buy-in from the top. You absolutely have to. This cannot be the VP of sales idea because he has some extra budget. This has to be something all the way to the top so that when the numbers get brought, that there is a separate line item that talks about pipeline influenced by marketing, SDR, whatever that happens to be. It has to have a place at the table. And then secondly, when you hire your first person, I always recommend always hire cohorts right? It sucks to come into a job and be the only person doing your job and not having someone to either ask questions or to bitch with, right? Yeah. It's always better to ask, to, to bring in two, but you have one chance to set the bar because wherever you hire initially, that is the line that every next hire is going to move toward. And if you bring it in too low, you, you'll, you'll never get the output you're really looking for. So t take your time, right? And hire the right person, pay someone, right? To come in and actually do a great job. Entrepreneurs are fantastic, but that intrinsic motivation and self-awareness are key with these individuals, right? Absolutely key. Excellent. Okay. And looking at goal setting for yeah. this initial team, and, and you, you had mentioned a really interesting process that you had for goal setting with like SDRs that are on your team. Can you tell me about that? And then I want to go to how would you set up the initial goals for the program? Goodness, yeah. Just so I make sure I understand your question. So sure. in terms of as I brought in these first two SDRs, how would I work to set set their goals and how would I measure them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would want to reverse engineer it from the top down. Okay. So I would want to, again, at the end of the day, when this report goes from me to the VP of sales, then in the QBR, he goes to the CEO or the CRO or whoever we have at that point is probably one person. That's all those things. You know, what, what is the high five? Like, wow, that was a great idea metric. And then we sit down with that metric and we de-evolve it down to our place. One thing that was introduced initially at Salesforce, and then I've used it multiple times and at, at New Relic, but really is sort of a, 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 a pyramid of goals where, you know, the, the corporate mission sits at the top of the pyramid and then every rung down is a different division. And how are we now, what is the output that and how does it affect the goal of the business? We would start with that goal and whether it's, again, whether it's touching leads, whether it's qualified meetings, whatever it happens to be, we start there and then we de-evolve it down to what the day-to-day -day action is going to be so that we all have a clear, a clear direction. But we all, we all understand why what we do on a day-to-day -day basis impacts our business 
And if we don't do our job, what our business will not get. So it rolls all the way up. Yeah, it goes all all the way up. Absolutely. Because right. that's the one thing too. Again, I go back to that whole entrepreneurial millennial mindset is I don't need a I don't need a pat on the back. I don't need constant, you know, people telling me that I'm I'm pretty and all that fun stuff. But at the end of the day, when I do something well, I want to make sure the business, right, that the business succeeded and got something out of it. Not that, oh, my boss was able to go say we did a lot of activities, but no one above him knows what, what activities we do, so no one really cares. Right. right. We want to actually talk that same vocabulary all the way up and all the way down. I would do the same thing in terms of building the organization, right? Because as you build the organization and you scale the organization, you're going to have different dot lines, as I like to call them. Right. So if you have now an inbound team and an SMB outbound team and then an enterprise strategic outbound team, every single one of those has a completely different metric that defines success. But it also lives within a completely different leader in the business, their OKRs or their KPIs. One of them is going to be the demand, the, you know, VP of demand gen. One could be our CMO. One could be the VP of sales. There could be those multiple people that all have stakes in this now and make sure that we're all driving toward those specific things. We want to have as much uniform goal as possible because we want the SD organization to you know, feel like one big family. But at the end of the day, we're pushing towards different things. But again, using those common practices that we can share and make each other better at, we just have different intricacies in terms of what comes out the other end. And I think because the sales development manager touches so many parts of the organization, it seems yes. like there's That's always – about I love about it too, right? Like right. Literally in some companies, dot line to every single leader in the business. It is. It is. You're interacting. Ass, but it's awesome. Well, that's what that's where I was going is that there's always going to be there's you know if you're in a family there's always at least one person who's upset about something right. you know over there <laughs> and um, is that just something that the SD manager has to live with or what what do you do if if there's just somebody's upset with the output of the production or or you know the the their SDR isn't producing enough and you know there's already always somebody upset it seems like oh wow. I'll, I'll start off by saying there is no perfect answer to this. But my opinion, to be honest, when someone comes to me and is upset, it usually means that that person and I didn't come to a true bi-directional agreement on the expectations. Because someone's either really upset with an output and – you know, a lot of times when you spread across different organizations, you have to make sure and explain to someone that, hey, I, I have four of you, right? And I have one number, which means I would love to spread 25% of my output across all four of you. But that's probably not going to happen. But what I am going to do is I'm going to guarantee you 25% of the effort from my team. So you are never going to get less effort than the person next to you. But just like your sales and your peers, Sales is cyclical, right? There's peaks and there's trough and one day it's your day and the next day it's someone else's day. So if it's not your day, I'm, I'm okay if you come to me and say, hey, show me the effort and I'll bring to you the fact that we gave you all the effort we possibly could and we hit those metrics. If we didn't, I will fall on the sword quickly, right? But I don't anticipate that. But also realize that, that someone else, the person that got the most out of the four of you, right, got the same effort. They just happen to get more output that quarter. It's going to come back, right? It's hard to say, but are, are we okay that at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we're going to sit down and know that the averages are going to be about the same, that any given quarter, may, it may not be your day. Yeah. And you'll get a lot of sales leaders that say, yeah, of course. And then their boss is on their ass and their team's struggling or there's some spiff that they really want to win. And they're going to come to you and blame it on you. Be the bigger man. Right. And just say, you know what? You're right. We put in equal equity. You know, here's here's just to show you. However, we didn't produce at the level that, you know, would allow you to hit your goal. We will do better next quarter. But what we won't do is give you more effort than the people next to you. Can you right. can we can we sit down this time in three months and reassess? Right. And, and I, I, I'm a little defensive because I've been in the sales <laughs> development world for so, so long, but it, it feels like th sometimes that the, your, the, the blame game is directed mm -hmm. toward the sales development leader. 
Oh, and, yeah. uh, and a lot of times, and maybe it's just from where I'm sitting, I, a lot of times it doesn't seem fair because uh, you're doing the best that you can with the resources that you have. And uh, you can't control whether, to be honest, the sales rep can close a deal or not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so if you want, if you want completely fair, this might not be the career for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, w- but, but I, I love your points that you're going through of how you handle this because you, you've got the sales development program locked down. I mean, you're doing everything possible that you can to produce the pi- pipeline for the sales team, but you're still going to have people that are upset and, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. And it's just, you know, again, it, it could be could be clarity of output and it could yeah. just be you caught someone on the wrong day and they needed someone they needed someone to blame. As long as, again, you are very you have clarity with all the other leaders and all the other people that you're with. At the end of the day, you know, it's not about you being right. It's about you trying to help that person, you know, change their either perception at that moment of you or come back and make them look amazing any opportunity you have to do that. I love that. I love that. And a lot of the people that listen to this, you know, they, they might be just entering their management career or they're newer in the management space. And, you know, there's a, there's a term, you know, gravitas, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's having that, that experience of how to maneuver these kind of situations. And they, and, you know, when you're first in the management ranks, you just don't have that. No. And, and, um, and so I think one point that you made is you can fall back on the, the numbers that you're producing and, and the, the statistics and things like that, because you can't really argue with that. But, right. but there's also building that, that relationship piece yeah. with the other, you know, cohorts that are in your yeah. space, right? Ab- absolutely. And don't never assume they know what you do. Uh-huh. Right? Never <laughs> assume. Black box. You- you can tell them a hundred times, like, you know, I don't report to you, <laughs> but I wouldn't say it in those words, right? And the other thing for new managers as well, and this is something I learned uh, later in my career, and I really, really wish I would have learned earlier, is always assume best intent in every situation. Ah, okay. Because you have no idea what the p- other person you're talking to is going through at that moment. And it may have nothing to do with them blaming you. It may just be something else that's going on. And if you just you know, take it and move forward and agree that the output wasn't there and make a commitment to be better next time. A lot of times those relationships get so much better as you come through versus just jumping in and and being defensive, which we can all be, especially when they call out our reps. If they're calling out me, I don't have a problem with that. I have thick skin. But if they're calling out my rep that I know killed his number and did everything I asked him to do plus more, he or she, right? Like that's when it starts getting on me. You know, I feel like the Oklahoma State coach, right? Like, I'm a man. Come to me. Like, <laughs> like I don't have the, I don't have the, the, the schlong haircut, though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And you know, some sometimes it could be on the flip side too, where they they saw the SDR on your team, you know, doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, like goofing around or. But I uh, play. I remember this. I got this one complaint about how they were playing ping pong, and they should have been making cold calls mm-hmm. and things like that. So, so you're kind of. I mean, as an SDR manager, you're kind of in between. You're the connective tissue, which is great because you get a lot of exposure within the company. But then, you know, those accidents happen at intersections, right? I mean, sometimes you you get uh, you get beat up a little bit. So. Exactly. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. This is great. I have one more question for you. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate it. We're coming up against the hour, Brian. This has been amazing. I was talking to somebody today who was saying, you know, I've been an SDR manager for a while. I might become a director, etc. But where where do you see the different avenues for career expansion? Um, do you, yeah. is are we looking at the a world where there's like a chief? sales development officer at some point or or you know what are the different avenues that you look at in your career as someone who's more experienced or that you could you could uh, share with with folks yeah you know it, it's interesting there there's two answers to that question and i think it depends on where you how far you went in your career before you jumped into a leadership role you know but when you and i cut our teeth 
you know, you had to you had to go into the AE ranks and close before you were then able to then become a manager. Because the mentality in those days and still today in a lot of companies is, you know, hey, your job is to not only make your team successful, but prepare them for the next role. So if I'm an SDR manager and I've never actually closed, how can I then train my SDRs to be closing AEs in the ESB team? Again, that's one con- one conceptual approach. You know, today you've got these amazing SDRs that have been an SDR for a while and either there's there's no room to move up to the AE side or they just don't want to and they're becoming SDR managers, right? So now I have two SDR managers that have completely different backgrounds. So I think have completely different career paths ahead of them. And I get a lot of questions from mentees and just people that reach out. I love the new LinkedIn feature where you can kind of put in what you're interested in and it'll bring up other profiles of people that have raised their hand and said, yeah, I'm willing to help people. I've talked to some amazing people recently that have kind of talked about like, if I want to be a director, if I want to be you know, an executive, if I want to be a VP in the SDR ranks, do I need to go back and be an IC for a couple years, right? Would that help me or should I just keep pushing? And if I want to be an IC, do I do it now? Do I, do I literally do it like, what do they say? The best two, best two times to plant a tree is 25 years ago and right this second. <laughs> okay. I, so it's, you know, and I, my question is, where do you want to be and how many options do you want? So if your options are, I want to move up within the ranks of SDR, right? Understand sales ops perfectly. Underman, understand what demand gen does. Understand what, you know, sales ops does and marketing does and all those individuals because that's really as you move up, you're less connected to sales besides the output than you are the process. Right. If you if you want to have opportunities to drive numbers, getting that IC experience is incredibly important. Really, really, really important because you learn a whole new subset of skill sets, not just to teach people, but in the conversations. You either, you know, on one side, you're talking SQLs and MQLs and sourcing and contribution. And on the other side, you're talking about closing and negotiation skills and, you know, negotiation tactics and all these other things that are very different than what you experience in SDR. So, you know, long, long winded answer to your question is that, you know, it's okay either way, because there are companies that will let you move in either direction, but you know, decide what you want to do as early as you can, and then understand what the skills are needed, not only to do that role, but what are you training people for and try to bring those skills to the table as well. I love it. I love it. And, and, you know, one other thing that I would add, and and this is just top of mind because I was talking to somebody about it is that, you know, if the marketing side of things is interesting, I, I feel like, what could be more beneficial to a marketing skill set than someone who ha- is very well versed in sales development? Because you're talking about how do I drive appointments? How do I build pipeline? How do I support the sales team? And really, you know, the marketing aspect is you're just going up one level of the funnel to start thinking about brand and awareness and, and, you know, Gartner and all that stuff. It's a, it's a a thing. I would think that you could click on the top, you know, pretty reasonably and really become an attractive, uh, you know, even CMO at some point. So, yeah, yeah. there's something we're working on here right Uh now, whereas there's a big disparity between data and actionable data, right? So to be able to sit in that marketing and SDR seat and say, Hey, yeah, marketing, you know, you have a great form and it asks them to fill out 25 things and they do it, but only three of those things can I actually do anything with. So the other ones don't matter to me. So why not have a, have five things, but add two more things that are actionable. So it'll actually allows me to then figure out what type of cadence this person should be in, what type of vertical ABM should they be in versus, Right. Like all these other things about, you know, their, their Skype address and, you know, <laughs> all this other yeah. stuff they have, which is great. But that, that's not actionable for me to get them into the right cadence to make them act, become a customer down the road. Exactly. One of one of the SDRs on a team in a past life was promoted to become a marketing program manager. And just having her in meetings was it's such a different mentality coming out of the SDR org to become a marketing program manager who was then supporting the SDRs because mm-hmm. she really understood like 
anything that you do on the marketing side has to drive conversations and, you know, appointments right. <laughs> for the sales team. And, and right. you know, she came at it from that mentality versus, hey, let me add, you know, a Skype address to this form because I don't know, I don't know what's going on. And right. so, uh, yeah, yeah, for me, it makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you yeah. so much, man, for this and for the invitation and just for all, all the conversations over the past couple of years since we've met. Um, I've enjoyed every single one of them. Brian, I have learned a ton. I really appreciate it. I think everybody on the call has as well. Thank you very much for being on the show and um, supporting the community, man. I appreciate it. Wonderful. We will see you soon. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast. The only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.